Can I start? <laughs> we good? We okay, hi. Sure we're going live. So somebody else say oh, we're yeah. going live. Start. Do we wait? Okay. I'll wait. Hey. We are live. We're going live. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Diana Vasquez, and I'm a graduate student here at FIU. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today for our first lecture of the School of Architecture lecture series. Um, we have the pleasure of having architect, curator, and scholar Luis Casanovas. Um, as I said before, uh, my name is Anna Vasquez, and I'll be moderating the discussion with Soraya Freewald and Natalie Guevara. So make sure your microphones are silenced during the discussion, and please hold your questions at the end, and then you may unmute your mic. And uh, as a courtesy, please also turn on your camera. Soraya? So with that, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today. Luis Alexander Casanovas Blanco is a New York and Madrid-based architect, curator, and scholar. He was the chief curator of the Oslo Architecture Triennale 2016, together with the After Belonging Agency. He was a Critical Studies Helena Rubinstein Fellow 2017-2018 at the Whitney Independent Study Program, and an IKKM Weimar Princeton Summer School of, for Media Studies Fellow 2016. His design work has been recognized with several prizes, including the Simon Architecture Prize 2018, the Bobble Prize 2019, and the FAD Prize 2017 for Architecture Theory and Criticism. He was a finalist for the Lisbon Triennale and Millennium BCP Debut Award 2019 for Architects Under 35. So, Louis, if you're ready, I'll pass things over to you now. Super. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see if I... Uh, Okay. Um, well, first of all, I would like to 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 thank you for for having me. Uh, and in the in the beginning of the course, so it's it's fantastic. Um, thank you so much, uh, Charlotte, uh, Diana, Biaina, Soraya, and, and Natalie for for organizing this and making this this work. And of course, uh, thanks, uh, Elisa, whom I've. Uh, known for a while now uh, and I've taught with, and it's been a super pleasure. Um, um, okay, so um, it's gonna be slow this or, okay. So I normally like to start with, um, um, with this video, which is not actually working, but uh, you, can, you can imagine what, what happens. Um, so that's that's a video that got quite famous uh, uh, during the the debates that that preceded the Brexit referendum around 2015. I don't know if you've had the the chance to see it, um, and the video should be working, but um, I don't know why it, it's not. But I mean, uh, what you see here is basically what happens. So there's this uh, hooded uh, and allegedly British individual which. Uh, attempts to burn uh, a EU flag. Um, uh, this video got viral uh, because um, actually the guy uh, makes a sort of like speech against uh, the belonging of the of the uh, uh, United Kingdom to the to to Europe to the European Union and says um, says uh, that that the European Union actually took and I'm quoting him. Uh, if you look at the video you'll you'll see it. Uh, he says, uh, the European Union took away our British nationality, our identity and our free speech, as well as our sovereignty. Interesting. So the guy approaches the flag with a lighter. Uh, and as you can see here, he tries to burn the flag. But um, if you look at the video, you'll see this guy trying to, buy the, to burn the flag for approximately two minutes and a half. Uh, and at the end, he will just surrender. The flag will never fly. Um, the thing is that the flag is uh, is uh, manufactured following um, uh, following the the laws of the EU on on um, on uh, textiles, uh, and uh, it's made of uh, a flammable a, 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 a flammable material. So. 
Um, basically, uh, um, it's made of a retardant material which won't allow it to, to burn. So um, the guy will be trying for a while with no result. I really like this video because while the guy talks about uh, things which seem very abstract as identity or things which seem like exclusively political and having nothing to do with like the our everyday life, architecture or design, actually we see that belonging or not to the European Union uh, also translates in the objects and the designs that surround us, right? Uh, the fact that the EU is part of the European Union is what doesn't let the guy burn the flag because it's uh, manufactured with a retardant material. And I'm very, very interested in this condition of spaces, uh, design, objects, uh, urbanisms, where um, although not apparent uh, on a first sight, we can start discovering a lot of um, you know, more abstract things as uh, politics, uh, economic interests, kind of like um, um, undergirding uh, the form and the material and the color, et cetera. I'm gonna be explaining today four projects. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the first project I, I ever did, um, and then gonna be jumping in through uh, three other more recent projects, which I believe in a way are pushing this idea, trying to understand how notions as belonging or identity or, or ideas of community in a way are embedded in, in architectural artifacts. So the first project I'm gonna talk about is uh, a refurbishment that uh, uh, in 2018, I was commissioned. And, and that's what the house looked uh, on the exterior um, uh, is a house in, in Cardadeu, which is um, a, a town 45 uh, kilo kilometers from Barcelona in Spain. And it, it's a house which was built up in the, in the 90s. And you basically see what it looks like, right? Which is like, it has the top, uh, like the staircase is embedded in a, in, a, in a kind of castle tower. It has Doric columns. Um, not a garage painted in green. So it's just sort of like a mishmash of things, which to me was very interesting because actually the house represented everything I had not learned in the School of Architecture. So uh, when I was faced with a commission, I was like, uh, what am I actually going to do with this? Like, I won't ever be able to photograph it and show it around, right? It's, it's kind of very, very extreme. And you not only have one house here, but you have like a row of five houses exactly the same for uh, like five um, um, castle towers, uh, five sort of like uh, uh, Greek verandas, very, very strange. Um, so the first I did before even designing was trying to understand why would somebody uh, end up building this in Spain in the 90s? Um, and why would somebody buy it? And why would somebody want after 20 years or no, 30 years, uh, want to kind of like change a few of the things that were happening on the inside? Because the refurbishment was basically addressed at, at solve a series of things that were uh, happening on the inside of the house. So um, after 2008, uh, um, news as such were all around. Uh, news as such were all around in in Spain. Um, this is a very famous. Um, this is actually a, a very famous uh, newspaper uh, called El País, where, as you can see, like uh, um, what it says is like, who's the responsible for the birth, for the um, um, real estate bubble, right? After two thousand and eight, with the fall of Lehman Brothers, uh, the subprime subprime crisis. Uh, you know, um, um, the real estate bubbles all around the world start bursting in the US with, you know, uh, a crazy number of foreclosures, but also in Spain, right? Um, and it's then when after 20 years where um, construction had been uh, in the country, the main, uh, let's say the main economic um, uh, source, um, people started asking like, why did this happen? Who's responsible for this? 
why did we invest uh, only on um, construction, right? Um, uh, there was a moment where in Spain, uh, construction meant uh, even uh, more uh, per capita than um, three uh, other smaller countries. Uh, I don't remember which ones. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Slovakia, uh, um, Slovenia, sorry. Um, well, anyway, it was massive. It was really crazy. And I was really interested in this idea of like who's responsible for this, right? Is is it uh, the person who's actually building the house, or is it the person who's buying the house? Uh, if there's a demand and people is uh, buying the houses, it means that you know maybe it wasn't that bad, but we filled up the country with this sort of like second residences, uh, looking one more bizarre than the other. Um, so basically. Um, I started looking at what had happened uh, where the house has been built. So you can see in here, um, um, you can see the house is actually in here, in this row here. And this is the town center uh, of Cardadeo. And basically you see that um, no, the town center is more or less consolidated. And then there is this kind of road which connects to uh, the neighboring town. And this had appeared in here uh, at some point, right? And that was technically not a, a, a close neighborhood uh, because it was kind of connected to the, to the town center, but that was actually the ambition. The ambition was to kind of render this sort of like uh, living here as close to an idea of countryside, countryside club, countryside house, so it was a sort of like bourgeois aspirational um, um, sort of uh, lifestyle, the ones that, that, that it was being sold to the people that uh, instead of like wanting to live here, uh, was offered a house here, right? Um, and that to me was very, very interesting. So um, again, as I'm saying, when I was faced with that and basically the, the, what the clients asked where uh, was, um, refurbish the interior of the house, which had leakings, but also they didn't like a few of the things that were there originally, and they wanted um, the house to look somewhat different. Uh, but basically there was a problem of leaks and a problem of like yeah. circulation of air yeah. that they wanted to amend. But let's say the first thing I did uh, was trying to outsource if possible, some sort of like view on the house, which could give me some information um, um, that I could uh, use uh, to start the project. I, I, I was kind of like paralyzed, didn't really know where to start. As I've said, I was trained in Barcelona and like um, uh, the house represented everything I had been told during the whole career, which is not okay. Uh, no, it's not modern. Uh, it doesn't follow any of the uh, precepts of modern movement, uh, you know, um, etc. So basically what I did is I, I love this magazine that I don't know if you've encountered um, uh, during your, before or, or during uh, you, your education, but, but it's a quite interesting um, um, magazine, which is called Apartamento. And it's a magazine which it's not exactly about architecture, but they do portray a lot of architecture. So it's a magazine about the houses of, of, of people, people which is normally artists or let's say some sort of like liberal professions, writer, et cetera, right? So they go, um, I don't know, to Paul Oster's house and they document how Paul Oster lives in his loft in, in, in New York, right? Um, and there was something uh, that I thought was incredibly powerful in their way of like documenting architecture or documenting spaces, which was, um, you, you see the sort of photos um, that are here, which is like, there's not, it's not um, um, the typical uh, architectural photograph with like very large conical views and perspectives, but actually it tries to portray how the spaces are lived in. So the shoes left here next to the sofa, a sort of like weird construction, uh, no, with a, a, a computer monitor for this person in front uh, you know, covering uh, herself with uh, an umbrella from the sun coming in from the window. So I, I thought that those photos were fantastic because they talked a lot about rather than describing the space through 
uh, you know, like more canonical ideas of materiality and space. It tried to portray how people lived uh, in those spaces, right? And, and that's what, uh, for the editors of the magazine, made those spaces unique rather than their architectural qualities uh, when, you know, like uh, the houses were delivered to these people. Um, so what I did is I contacted um, one of the main uh, photographers of this magazine and I asked him to come photograph uh, the house of, of, of Jaume and Maria Lisa, who were the clients, this house in, in Cardadeu. Um, I knew the house, you know, like it wasn't super interesting on a, an architectural level, as I've said, but neither on a special level. So it's just a domino structure which has uh, had, uh, no, uh, which has been added this sort of like uh, postmodern, neo uh, romantic, uh, neo medieval elements. But it's actually a quite banal domino structure of slab on the top of another slab and on the top of another slab. So there was no, I mean, there, there was no space per se to photograph. Um, and I asked uh, this photographer, Adria Cañameras, to photograph the house. And I left him there for a day. And he came up with photographs as such, where um, what I thought it was interesting, he was showing how um, um, the client, Jaume Maria Luisa, had appropriated the space, which one of the strategies they followed is to fill everything with plants, right? Or uh, you see here more plants, right? And, and even when, when Adria started photographing certain elements of the house, um, no, with a specific uh, look, I, I, I thought it was, I, I thought those elements, which I considered so banal, became interesting, right? As is the case of, of this column, um, you not know, this sort of prefabricated uh, Doric like column uh, standing here. But this was actually the, the, the photograph that he did that kind of like triggered the whole project, right? Um, um, and that was kind of revelatory for me. If, if you look at this image, which uh, this image is, is, um, is the, the, the uh, bedroom of, of the two clients, of Jaume and Maria Luisa, no? And there's a mix of things, no? The, the space is very simple, as I'm saying, but, but there's a mixture of objects here, which kind of makes it appealing. So to start with, you have um, the, the, the BH5 uh, lamb by Paulson, right? Which is kind of like cohabiting with other ideas uh, of design uh, with this sort of crochet dubet, right? And, and I've talked uh, to the clients about, about this crochet and, and Maria Luisa told me that, that that was something that her uh, grandma did for her. You know, it took a long time uh, when she got married. So, you know, what I, what I thought it was interesting about this, um, um, this photograph is that there are many ideas, layered ideas of what design can be, right? Uh, we have like, what we can understand as, um, you know, uh, undebatably uh, under design. Like, there's no debate that this lamp is designed. Like, you'll find it in any, uh, you know, like survey of uh, modern design um, that you look at. But, but, but uh, the people in the house had the belief that this somehow was design, right? And it is, I feel, and was definitory for them. On the other hand, you have you no know, the bed and everything, and then you have here this small kind of altar with this sort of uh, Christ, which is always uh, you know, surrounded by flowers, which the owners go down and and and, and make as a sort of like offer. Um, so, what I liked about this image is first these ideas, overlapping ideas of design, which in a way what they did is like expanded uh, what we can understand as design. Um, but also that it talked about rituals and the ways that people were using the house, pretty much as the, the, the picture we were looking before of the woman with the umbrella, right? Um, another thing that I did, like after, after the, the, the photos of, of at the after, I, saw them, I started to have an idea of like where the project could lead to. But, um, but I was still like, I kind of met, missed something. And what I did after is I went to talk to the original constructor of the house. And it was very interesting because that was a, a, a constructor which had a company and had a, some sort of architect uh, who you know, signed the projects for him, but actually he was the one doing the, the whole design. Um, so I went to interview him because I wanted to know like, where do those things, where do the new medieval uh, tower comes from? Like why next to 
you know, like why have five towers one next to the other? Um, and I went to see him and I found uh, like uh, he, um, he wanted to meet at, at his place. And when I arrived, I saw an incredible garden where I could recognize a few of the things that were also um, in Jaume's and Maria Luisa's house. So for example, I arrived and there was this sort of folly, which was like a, a, a winter garden, but also these sort of replicas of like famous architectures. If you see the, the one behind uh, uh, is actually um, a, a kind of like um, a Gaudi-like replica of the Gherkin, uh, the, the, the building in London by, by Foster. Um, no, and then, for example, these columns in here, which are pretty similar to the columns uh, that appear in the house of of, of Jaume and, Maru and Maria Luisa. So the garden was this sort of like testing lab for him to test like architectural details, which he would later on apply to his constructions. Um, um, and when I talked to the, to the constructor, uh, whose name is uh, Steofilo Ortega, um, I actually asked him why he was doing such strange details. Where, where were those details coming from? And what he told me was that in the 90s in Spain, um, the, 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 offer, the housing offer was that vast that you needed uh, to singularize what you were doing. Uh, because he was saying like that the territory was getting filled with houses which they did all look the same. So I started to think which way I could market my buildings so they would attract um, an interest from a, from a buyer, right? So in a way, what, what that uh, to me was uh, very interesting is that, that basically, you know, and I insisted, it's like, do you have any affinity for, I don't know, for Greek architecture? And he was like, no, like, not really. Like all, all these things actually are sort of like come from, from an economic strategy, right? From a marketing strategy. So um, to me, that was very interesting. It's like, if we consider those things an economic strategy rather than an aesthetic as, uh, a strategy or an, uh, an architectural strategy, maybe they do become interesting, right? Um, and maybe then we can assign them some value because they are actually very definitory of, uh, of the period, right? They, they sort of become, you know, like um, an archeological object which talks us about what was happening 30 years ago in Spain. So basically, I started uh, with these premises. Uh, the first is that that the house uh, could have an interest uh, further than the details, architectural details that we were just seeing. So the details actually kind of hit uh, economic uh, information, desires, etc. So maybe they were worth preserving, right, in a specific way. Um, and then with this idea of like the different kinds of design that I saw in the in the bedroom of, of Jaume and Maria, and Maria Luisa. So basically, um, I've centered like with this Castellot, basically the, 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 the part that was more damaged was the staircase, which required maintenance on the on the top, but also it was all open and they wanted to sectorize so they could uh, use like air conditioning. Uh, and heating on the top floor and, and you know, it, it, it was cost effective. It was kind of like controllable and manageable. So basically what we decided is like, let's focus on the staircase, which before the intervention was, uh, as I'm saying, like you see clearly the tower on the exterior, but on the interior, you had no notion that you were on a cylinder. There was no special experience and there was no singularity of the staircase actually was as I'm insisting, a very banal domino structure um, uh, building. So basically what we decided is to, instead of like uh, have an approach, like a, you know, like a very determined, like a very like predetermined approach, uh, what we did is to work with each of the elements uh, in each of the floors and trying um, precisely as, as I was saying, trying to understand how they came to be and what information and value they were carrying, right? Um, so again, we did this very detailed drawing where, uh, as you can see, for example, here, the, the room that was so revelatory appears and we took the time to draw absolutely everything that we thought could uh, have information. Um, the plans were absolutely crucial for us. Um, um, no, as I saw through the, as, as we saw, or as we appreciated through the photographs of, uh, of Adria Cañameras, 
but also you know, the cat, this cat that the, the Maria Luisa, the, the, the client told us that she was battling all the time because the cat was kind of like, uh, you know, carving out in the plan. So we tried to do a drawing which contained as much information as possible and where information was non-hierarchical. So let's say uh, wall had no much more information than a cat or a flower or a pavement, right? Um, the, the project was somehow forming around all those things, sort of suspending this, this hierarchy. And, and this is basically the, the intervention that I'm gonna walk you through now. Uh, and, and I think that once you see the interventions with it, it, it will be much more clear. So basically what we did is uh, we took seriously the staircase and the space of the tower, which before was not expressed within the interior of the house. So we enclosed it, um, uh, we enclosed uh, the sort of staircase on the top floor, but we tried to maintain a unity of it, right? Um, so somehow we tried that the house where the staircase before was just like letting to slabs became space in itself and sort of um, organized uh, the life uh, in the house around it. So that's the, the entry floor. And as you can see what we did here, we uh, found this sort of like um, Andalusi-like tile. And, and what we decided to do is like, what if we consider this is kind of like a basement for the house? So what we do is like, we paint the, the doors uh, in a way where, you know, like this sort of like um, uh, tiling uh, base gets weight, right? And, and has more importance because actually it's very interrupted. As you can see, like you have a, a part here, a part here, a part a little bit here. So that's why we decided like, okay, let's, um, let's paint the doors and like give it more kind of weight uh, to see what happens. And, and we came up with this solution um, um, where, you know, suddenly you could, um, you know, um, these things that before were kind of uh, isolated fragments started to talk as if they were a kind of a, a base. And, and actually, I know that the idea of the base and, and the weight of the building is a kind of a very classical architectural idea, right? It's like the tectonic. And, and, and I, what I thought it, that what was excite, exciting to me is that we were doing it with this kind of like fake tiles, which are considered of that base, right? That you can find in a bar where they cut uh, jamon. No, and suddenly we were using like, very respectable uh, architectural, uh, absolutely validated strategies with materials which in a way were not part of that discourse, right? And, and basically we're trying th th these kind of things. I'm gonna walk you um, uh, to, the, to the next floor. So basically if you look at the floor, it has this sort of like pavement, which is um, it's ceramic, but imitates uh, pink marble, right? And um, when I first started to work on this, all my colleagues were like, the first thing you have to do is remove the pavement, right? Uh, and put, I don't know, um, uh, um, a wood pavement or something less, let's say, folkloric. But, but actually, you know, this sort of like aspirational material, it's like, you no, know, it's like if we all could have like pink marble on our floor, we would, but it's just extremely expensive. So, you know, it's like um, at some point, uh, all these sort of fakes started to appear and to furnish all those houses, which as, as I've said before, they were triggered by a sort of bourgeois desire of the countryside house, et cetera, right? So that's why we decided, so let's, let's make this pink marble thing a thing instead of removing the pavement and let's paint all the staircase in pink and see what happens. And, and this is what it looked like. And um, I think that before uh, you saw already this lamp that we, sorry, this lamp that we designed on purpose. Ah, okay. This lamp. And this lamp for us was like, you know, like, we was kind of playing with this idea of the, of the castle, you know, of, of, of the aristocracy, uh, aristocratic objects. And in a way was trying to, um, was, a neon chandelier, we call it like chandelier, no? Because it, it made the sort of like hanging, um, no, hanging uh, sort of wires that the chandelier has, but it's all made, made of, of neon and it keeps repeating around the, the staircase, sort of like giving it a, a unity. 
And one of the things we wanted is once we had, once we finished and photographed the house, we wanted to photograph the house, not isolating only what we did, but you know, um, my uh, friend and super fantastic photographer, Jose Evia, who who's the, the one who photographed um, the intervention, I asked him like, please, like, let's do a test where, you know, like things which were already there appear ne next to things that we've done. And let's see if there is some sort of connection if we are speaking the same language. Um, so he started making those pictures where uh, those photos where, you know, the, the, the Christ and, and the flowers, which we touch nothing about, kind of appears counterposed to all the intervention with flowers here, uh, you know, with this kind of like bright color on the staircase. Um, and I'm going to walk you through the last floor. So one of the other things we did is, uh, and that's kind of difficult to, to explain, um, 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 is, you know, uh, we went back to this idea of the crochet, you know, and this sort of design, which is mostly, you know, which has to do with the textile and which is such an important part of our domestic experience. Think about curtains, um, tablecloths, um, uh, you know, duvet, uh, blankets, etc but which somehow has been absolutely neglected from architectural history. So what, I, when I was at school, you know, like nobody would make a project considering, you know, the curtains or textiles of a home or, you know, that was considered of like an addendum, something which always came later, right? And, and to me, it was exciting to think, what if we turn this element, uh, which, which, which has been such downplayed in architectural history in something which is really characteristic of the intervention we do. So basically, um, I discovered that that the client, that Maria Luisa, not only had this dubé made by her uh, grandmother, but actually herself um, um, was doing this sort of stuff, right? Uh, which is called bolillos. I, I don't think there's something similar in the US, but it's basically this super crazy technique, almost algorithmic. This is kind of proto-parametrics, um, but it, no, it's proto-parametrics from the uh, 15th century, right? Uh, where, you know, like you keep waving and you put a needle which allows you to do the, the knots correctly. Uh, so basically what we did is we worked with her uh, in a pattern that would be used for one of the curtains that would protect uh, the house from uh, the sun, right? Um, but, um, you know, to give it another value, uh, we contacted this company, uh, which is actually in the US, uh, which is called Dynema, and which they claim they make the uh, strongest fiber in the world. And you can see in the website, the sort of like thing they, 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 they manufacture for the military, um, you know, like uh, her, uh, their textiles are used in like uh, life vests. So I asked them if they could like send me samples. Um, and we waved this thing, which is normally weaved in cotton using that thing with the hopes that we could use it to hang the, the curtain. But uh, no, as, as I was saying, like, I love this mixture between like what's kind of left out and considered like irrelevant and, and actually we should think why it's considered irrelevant, maybe because it's something that that women used to do, no? So I think there's a gender bias in the consideration or the not inclusion of all these um, um, kind of census materials within architectural histories. Um, and I really liked the counter position of like this sort of like vindication of, of uh, gender labor and um, another absolutely gender labor as is the army or the military, right? Um, but there's there was another thing, which is um, all the houses in Spain at a given point had this thing which was called Godele, which I've been told a few times how uh, it translates in English, but um, steeple paint, I think, or, or something like that. But basically that's a technique that comes from the moment of like the real estate construction where, you know, everyone uh, was building that, that, that's where the money was. And that meant that sometimes laborers were not super skilled. And when they were trying to make, a, a, let's say, a super um, um, smooth wall, they would fail. So they invented this technique where, you know, like, it's like, okay, if we cannot do a smooth wall, we are just going to like um, um, drip on the top of it. So it, it won't be noticed, right? 
And at some point, um, these which came from a sort of like a form of unskilled labor uh, became uh, sort of like marker of style and everybody wanted this in their houses. So it was appealing to some sort of rusty countries of like sensitivity, you know, to uh, the, the, the traditional wall made out of rock, which, you know, some, somewhat has a texture to it. And everyone, everyone, everyone wanted it. Everyone went crazy with it. So um, the house was all covered with this. But the clients were like, we don't want this anymore. Uh, precisely because, you know, it was super famous at some point. And then it became, um, you know, it became this sort of like thing that anybody wanted anymore um, by the 2000s. But to me, that was such a uh, you know, powerful and definitory thing of the house that what I propose them is, why don't we do a sort of peeling no, in this part of the staircase? So we actually um, tried to make a mold. We couldn't, so we had to do it apart. So we made uh, the pattern that was reproduced in the wall with, uh, lat with latex, and then use this sort of peeling, what, this sort of peeling of the wall, it wasn't really, but it was conceptually, right? Um, as a curtain to control the sun in the staircase, right? So the gotele, this thing, the, st the staple paint won't be there anymore, but it could somehow be, right? So, uh, and you see here the tests that the, um, the technician did trying to get, uh, you know, the, the texture that the original wall had. So this is what I was telling you before that we did, um, we wanted to to use the the sort of like weaving uh, uh, the crochet to hang the curtain, but the curtain came out super crazily heavy. And despite we were using the the the, the best, uh, let's say the so called strongest fiber in the world, it it, it it started deforming so much. So that's why we put it um, on the bottom of it. But we took these photos of of a few of the of the um, prototypes with it. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So basically you have this curtain that, uh, you know, like uses the rounded uh, plan of the, of the tower and that, you know, can cover the, the, um, the windows. And there's a last thing, um, which is like this idea of the garden, which, you know, undergirds any of the, like the, any idea of the real estate um, construction housing is kind of tied to an idea of the sprawl and the uh, garden city. Um, so the garden was an important element for, uh, for these people um, when they bought the house. So they wanted to have exterior space where to do, you know, um, uh, dinners, etc. right? And they got these incredible views because uh, all the stuff that was in front of the house was uh, sold in 2008. So they were going to build up here, uh, meaning the views were going to disappear. Um, but, you know, because of the crisis, they never did. And it appears that they would never do. Or they might when, when Spain recovers from, you no, know, when, when construction in Spain recovers uh, its 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 uh, its space um, to levels uh, akin to the ones of, of before two thousand eight. So, this idea of like they have a garden with views, but they might not have it at some point, right? Because these kind of buffer spaces between the city and and uh, this uh, specific neighborhood can be at any point uh, uh, built up, right? Um, so with this idea in mind of the garden, we thought like, what if we reverse, you know, if the garden is behind the house, we turn the staircase into a sort of like hanging garden. And um, that's what we did. I worked with um, some, um, um, some couple of, of young uh, uh, designers that were, uh, their names is uh, Alvaro Carrillo and Paula Curras. They were working on prototypes uh, of like plants which would filtrate air uh, very effectively. And I propose them, like, would you like to think about a garden kind of mechanized, which incorporates a few of the things that you're testing out? Um, um, would, you, would you like to design a garden for, 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 the, for the staircase? And, and they were fantastic and they uh, jumped in um, um, immediately, right? And basically, I don't know if you can sit here, but um, what they did, and that's what I liked a lot. Uh, and that's why I, um, I approached them, uh, uh, um, First, 
is that um, the garden in you no know, that idea of nature that that is sort of like a, um, no being close to nature, being close to some sort of the forest that all these kind of like neighborhoods which appeared around had uh, during the real estate boom during the during the bubble were so artificial because like by getting closer to the forest it means you were building more and thus you were kind of like diminishing the surface of like um, natural surface. So there was this sort of like built-in paradox, uh, not within wanting to be away from town, closer to nature, you know, uh, et cetera. And at the same time, devouring territory by building, 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 building. So um, I thought that the idea of garden that had to be implemented in here had to have some sort of twist where it was pointing to this very artificial machinic-like character of what was being done at the time uh, that that house was built, right? And if you see here, they have these, um, um, the, the, all the plants are kind of sensed with like sensors and they have these, uh, I have a, you see like, uh, they have like um, um, fans which help them circulate air and filtrate air, but also there's this sort of screening here which tells the clients when the plants need uh, water, uh, when, uh, um, you know, um, what the, the quality of air is. So at the end, it's a garden which works as almost as an AC machine or as a purifying air machine. And this is how the staircase looks uh, on the top of, of, the, of, the, of the staircase. And we tried this with, you know, um, it worked maybe twice, uh, but we, we actually, if you've seen here, um, Sorry, if you've seen here, it has embedded a sort of diaphragm uh, window-like. And the idea was that, you know, if the garden is a machine to close it up from the sun, uh, from, from sunlight, you also, uh, you know, you use something which is very machinic-like again. But yeah, we, yeah, we, we couldn't make it work much, uh, but this is, um, um, these photos were taken a few of the times that, that, that we could manage to close it up. This is how it looks uh, from the third floor, uh, from the second floor, sorry. And this is the studio that it's on the top, which is now sectorized, right? And where you recognize that here there is a space of another nature, which is the staircase. Um, interesting things of, of the project is that there were a couple of spin-offs where it's like people suddenly started asking us um, to design for like to, to, to to sell them uh, the chandelier. And we started working on, on making a commercial prototype uh, for the chandelier, which it's now under production. Um, it's super fragile, which means that it cannot be sent long distances, but we've worked with a couple of like package uh, designers in order to make uh, some sort of like very strong way of transporting it. Um, and then we also rethought, you know, instead of being all the time on the ceiling, we rethought um, the lamp as uh, as being able to 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 be placed in many places to be hanged to be under the top of the table to be against the wall etc. Um, and another thing which I thought it was interesting and that loops back to um, um, what I what I was uh, mentioning before um, uh, this idea of the politics embedded in everyday uh, design. Is that suddenly, you know, in a in a in a magazine in Australia, they were interviewing uh, sociologist Saskia Sassen, which is a, a pretty well-known sociologist, which mostly works on on topics on globalization and the city. Um, but she approaches the city not from an architectural standpoint of view, or not only, but mostly from a sociological economic point of view. And they made her uh, uh, in this magazine, this Australian magazine. They they made her uh, an interview, and and then they contacted me and they asked me if they could use images of the house to illustrate what she was saying. Basically, what she was trying to say is that any economic transaction uh, has, uh, you know, a uh, special implication in the city. And and to me it was very very exciting that suddenly the house, you know, started circulating. Um, with another meaning which was not exclusively, you know, it's architectural or spatial or material value, but which was talking about the bubble, um, no real estate politics, real estate aesthetics. Um, and in a way, I thought that this enlarged what the audience of, of architecture could be. Um, 
And this is a video that, yeah. let me see. So basically that's a video that that's known as which is this company um like it's the media division of of Lee Wilson, uh has a company which kind of like uh, makes videos of many things and and one of them is architecture and they got interested in the house and they asked um this um um filmmaker called Joana Puluma, which is a young super brilliant filmmaker in Spain to make a short, super short piece about the house. And 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 again, like I think the, this ends up to the things we were discussing before, which is like the house suddenly started to circulate amongst many other media, which were not exclusively architectural media. Um, um, and, and I think that that to me was exciting because it sort of expanded uh, what arch how architecture can be discussed. And um, I think I'm just gonna jump like always calculating, miscalculating time, but I'm, I'm just gonna show you two super quick projects, um, which is, this is, um, uh, this artist asked me to design um, a space for people to gather in a gallery in Barcelona. And basically uh, he was fed up that all the educational spaces in, in museums normally do have uh, uh, kind of like this sort of like infantile look, no, a bright colors or uh, wood. So he wanted something which looked sophisticated and which people could really appropriate, uh, you know, and it, which it became almost a singular point where people would really want to be discussing uh, art or, you know, doing some sort of activity in the room, right? Um, so basically, um, um, the, the gallery, which is La Capella, is located in a, in a very interesting neighborhood. Uh, uh, which concentrates, um, it's a very diverse neighborhood, um, but it has a lot of uh, low income uh, inhabitants uh, and tourists. So there's these sort of like crazy overlaps in the kingdom. Um, this is how the, the space looks like. And as you can see, like there, there was actually no uh, a space where people could meet, you know, in a petit comité and have a more intimate conversation. So basically, I came up with. Um, sorry, with this prototype, uh, which, you know, we were meant to do five, then we ended up doing two. It looks like another museum is going to ask for them. But the idea was to create this sort of object, which first, you know, it takes into account that, you know, movable things in architecture are always complicated because you need somebody to move them, right? And, and you need, let's say, you need like load force. And uh, in the specific case of this museum, there's just two people at the time working there, the, the person at the door and the person who takes care of the space. So basically um, um, what we decided to do is like, let's do the, uh, a, an object which is as light as possible, right? So a single person can carry it around. And we came up with this sort of like very minimal structure, which was kind of like very whiffed uh, uh, within itself. So it was kind of like consistent enough to hold people on the top of it. But at the same time, it was super light. It was 70 kilos only. And we put uh, um, 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 wheels, uh, bic bicycle wheels on it. So it could be very easily rearrangeable. And that was another thing, which is like to consider that, that, that the space where people can meet and have a conversation can have several positions, you know, a debate position, uh, well, these are some of the of the drawings we did at the at the beginning um, um, when we were thinking about about the the prototype. This is like a single prototype by itself, 
his here is as I was saying a single person moving it around. So um, what's interesting is like is an object which can uh, um, it can allow around like what twenty like very squeezed but twenty people and it can be carried around by a single person. Um, and also what it was very important for us it was that it had di different ways of rearranging. Uh, and moving around the, the room. So for example, if an artist wanted to give a talk in front of one of his pieces or her pieces, he could just take one of the units and put it in front of it. And people could see it looking at it and who he could explain a bit. If he wanted to take it and uh, to the street and have an, a conversation uh, in the open air, he could. So in a way, flexibility was very important for us. This is one of the modalities it has, which is kind of like an amphitheater modality where you can like um, put it together, but you could also like make it in a sort of like debate-like form. And it's how like a crazy, re like a, a more random rearrange rearrangement would look like. Um, why it looks like that? Um, we were seeing that, you know, this thing we were talking about um, tourists all around um, the, the neighborhood, you know, on the top of like a low income, kind of uh, communities, many migrant communities, um, you could really sense uh, the local, uh, like the spaces or the, the new facilities that were kind of contributing to gentrification and which were devoted to tourists because like crazily, they would all have these chairs, which is you not know, the Acapulco chair. And, and we go back to ideas of design. No, the Acapulco chair is a chair, which is like high design or design. We agree that design, but it's very cheap too. Right, it's not as buying a Petra Gary chair, right? So it's a kind of like affordable design object, which means that every single uh, bar terrace in Barcelona has it. So you can walk around the Raval and like, uh, you know, it's like you, there's not gonna be a time where you are not gonna see, you know, a, a hotel terrace or a bar or even like a shop with those chairs, right? So we decided to take that into advantage and say like, if that's around, why don't we work from the techniques uh, and the materials uh, um, which this chair displays? And we did a lot of like, once the structure had been done, we did a lot of tutor tutorials uh, through YouTube to understand how, you know, the chair is weaved and we kind of worked this direction. But also I think that what's important to us is that What's very interesting about the Acapulco chair, I don't know if you've, I'm, I'm sure all of you, like, I'm sure like in, in, in Florida, it's, it's full and it's everywhere too uh, of Acapulco chairs. It's comfortable, but not. So it's always difficult to sit in an Acapulco chair, right? It's like, you're kind of like behind and like the, the body position is kind of very informal noise. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's comfortable, but also it's very, it's kind of strange, you know, you're there. so. We like that. We, we like that because we thought that, you know, it's like you're not standing up uh, right and having a serious conversation. You're there like kind of lying in between, like lying down, but not really. So, you know, we thought that, that the fact that the body is in this kind of like weird, informal, like relaxed position could, um, you know, make of educational activities in the museum something less rigid and less serious, right? Um, so that's why if you see here, it has this kind of balls where people can like lie down uh, if they wanna have their back kind of like um, um, supported. Um, so, you know, like there's no way to have a very serious conversation. Like conversations have to be in a way informal. And what happened that COVID came and we were unable to test all those things uh, until, until recently, which, um, um, these pieces were moved to another museum and they are starting to use it to use them again so but basically like the project was like installed when COVID came and then you know like protocols where it had to be cleaned up all the time and you couldn't like um, it couldn't be used so we really don't know how it would have worked if it could have worked as we imagined and as I'm assuming um, Soraya and Natalie that we are uh, I mean, we're, we're tight on time. I'm just um, going to explain one last project, which is the one I've been working on more recently, which is a competition, um, um, which is not going to take me much. So hold in there with me, um, which is a competition that we lost. 
Um, and, and of course, when somebody lo loses the competition, then, you know, you start formulating in your head very clear ideas of why you've lost a competition. Uh, and, and, and to me, super clear why we lost, right? But I don't know, you know? And, but basically, um, there was a competition to redo a beach in Spain. And the brief was saying that the beach had been, you know, um, constantly menaced by the by climate uh, crisis aspects as the rising of water, but also, you know, very intense, uh, um, very intense rain, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, and as you can see here, this is not the, the beach that we were asked to, um, to uh, kind of like work on in the competition, but it's a beach next to it. And what it says is like, the beach of Deveses in, in Denia disappears four months after it has been like, uh, uh, four months after sand has been uh, implemented again by uh, the government. And that's something that keeps happening. You know, it's like you put sand, but the sand goes away because, you know, it's, it's a sort of artificial move. Um, um, you know, waters are rising and, um, um, and, you know, like, and climate is getting more extreme. So it's a kind of futile thing, right? It's like, you can keep putting sand, but sun is going to disappear sooner or later. So um, important to say is that I did this competition with uh, two uh, landscape, young landscape architects, which are absolutely brilliant. And when we first like talked about it, that's what um, uh, them, which is uh, that Bombay and said, Denise and said, it's like, okay, so everyone is going to put sand, right? Because when you think about the beach, you think about sand. And, and when you think about, you know, a comfortable beach, you think about sand, but that's just, Futile. It's like not understanding the time we're living in, where that is impossible anymore. And we just did this kind of like uh, look through periodicals. And yes, absolutely, no. All the beaches there, uh, which are being re-implemented, sand need to uh, be done so every four months or so, which is ridiculous, right? So how can we think what the beach will be in the time of climate change, right? Uh, maybe we need to, uh, uh, you know, make ourselves. A different idea of what a beach is or it's going to be right so basically what we started doing is um no and this is uh sorry so this is what we did on the beach uh no uh, this was the the beach there were images of the beach here but i don't know why they are not showing up but basically what we did is um you know, um, uh, within uh, within all these cliffs, because um, because of you know like the extreme weather and um, and uh, the floods, uh, rocks are falling down. So what we said is like, why don't we use the, those rocks which are constantly falling down to protect somehow the the beach, right? And we think uh, the beach is a sort of artificial rocky like beach. Uh, which for sure is going to last longer and it's going to protect and allow for more biodiversity than the sand, which is going to be disappearing continuously and being replaced. So the idea was basically to work with what was falling down and use that, uh, no, what, was bring, uh, what was being brought to the beach, the rocks, uh, all the elements, and use them to consolidate the coastline as it was right now, right? Um, here they are, the images of how it looks like. But as you can see, no, it has this very uh, intense cliff here where, you know, like rocks are constantly falling. Um, and this is uh, where the project was meant to be located, all this space, right? Um, Eva. Um, this is how, what the beach looks like. And you can see that there's very few sand already, right? So that's why from the very beginning, our idea was like no sand. Sand is, you know, yes, sure. It's, it's, it's fantastic to be in a beach, sandy beach, but, but it's just unfeasible to believe that this can, uh, uh, can be that for much longer, right? Um, and this is how it looks like. You see how reduced the space is. So basically what we wanted to do is to work uh, all these as a single surface and work as if it was a sort of artificial cliff which arrived itself to the, to the water. Um, you see here 
no? the rocks uh, which are constantly falling. Um, and that's one of the drawings that, you know, we worked at a slower scale at the beginning. And we thought about this last landscape uh, in, of something very constructed, right? Of a process where, you know, like the rocks that were falling were uh, being uh, kept in this sort of like net-like pergola and then, uh, or sort of canopy, and then machines were moving the rocks into the coastline, right? And uh, then through, you know, a process of like using concrete, et cetera, consolidating the new coastline, right? Which is, um, let me... Um, so when one of the reasons that I'm telling that I know we didn't want uh, is this is this uh, section right? It's like who wants to be in the beach with you know like th those are temporal lines which are different. It doesn't mean you are in the beach while there's a crane there moving rocks. But but we thought this document was important to render how we need to start thinking about those natural spaces as actively having a maintenance, right? And thinking about the process not as exceptional, but as continuous, if we wanna keep them. Um, and basically we came up with this process where, uh, sorry, we, we would, as you can see here, we would put the rocks, hey, bueno. we would put, um, we would put the rocks uh, in here, right? And start, expanding a little bit the platforms of the beach on the top of them, right? But those rocks were not brought from anywhere else, were rocks which actually were carried by uh, floods into the beach. Um, and this is how the plan looked like. And as I'm saying here, working with this landscape, um, Architects, but but also this a, a, a person in a person in the office did this incredible drawing where it explains that you know because of the cliffs and because of the intense rain, which is now uh, the new normal, let's say in the area, it it didn't used to be, but because of the the the, the change of like uh, climate patterns, it is now. Um, the, the the beach is exactly located in a place where you know it could obstruct uh, the water to flow, and then you know like that would only cause more destruction and damage. So we thought as the beach, uh, instead of like considering the beach as an obstacle for the water flowing towards the sea, we thought of, uh, we thought of, uh, we kind of thought of it as an instrument which kind of helps the water ride the sea. And this is how the proposal looked like. And just super briefly, you know, we had to put a number of amenities and we put them in fake rocks, uh, uh, which came from this idea of these kind of fake rocks, which had proliferated in the beginning of the century in Spain. Everyone was trying to build fake rocks or building houses within rocks. And we thought that that, you know, instead of putting like an ephemeral kind of like uh, a rest room and restaurant to have the rock and to be able to protect everything where there were floods or the tides were growing up, uh, would imply less uh, maintenance. And this is uh, how the beach looked like from, uh, let's say, um, um, the the restaurant and the restrooms that I was discussing, and this is hard sort of coastline that we were discussing, which is like, okay, let's start, you know, um, making an effort, um, for example, from the architectural discipline to rethink the beach in many other ways, which are not the traditional ways of thinking the beach, and that's why we wanted to make this very playful image, almost if like the person who was taking the picture splashed on the camera and there was a lot of movement and people was having a lot of fun in a bit which was hard, right? Which was kind of not soft, not super, uh, let's say, uh, rejecting to appear natural even, right? Um, and I think I'll, I'm gonna leave it here, uh, which I went uh, over the time I was assigned. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, Soraya and and Diana and and Natalie. I don't know if I should like. You're good. Your Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now Natalie will be will be opening up questions now. So uh, Natalie will begin with the first one. Perfect. Um, hi, Luis. Uh, thank hi. you for your presentation. Uh, I really appreciate how your practice sort of takes into consideration the construction and materials, and also the the meaning behind it. Um, 
at, at the different scales that you showed us today. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, so with the approach of architecture being a social practice, uh, what perspectives have you gained from working and collaborating with other artists um, that use different mediums to express their work? I should answer it now, right? So thank you so much, Natalie. Like the, the truth is that I actually really li like most of the projects that I'm showing, except the house are projects that I've worked in with somebody else. And I've worked a lot with artists, basically artists with work with pedagogy. Um, and I think that what, what's been very interesting to me is that the notion of client gets transformed suddenly into the notion of that spectator or the notion of, let's say, the participant, right? Um, but still, there's a relationship there, which is a sort of hierarchical or is a relation of exchange or whatever you want to pose it. And that to me has been very, very interesting to see how other people approach this, how to deal, uh, no, how to deal with like the public, right? Which in our case is clearly a client, uh, but in other disciplines, it's not. And, and I think that some, a few of the strategies that other people use to approach uh, no, the desires or the frustrations or, or the wills or the economic means or the uh, capacity of that public can be very, very, um, um, can be transformative to use them in, in architecture. For example, uh, I, I've used, there's a project I haven't shown, but which I did with another uh, uh, artist which works in, uh, with pedagogy, Gabo Kamnitzer, and the one I've, I've uh, uh, shown of the blue um, moving thing, um, thing is with uh, an artist which works with pedagogy. Um, and it's super interesting because you feel you are talking to the institution no? you are building for, which is like the client is the gallery, right? So I'm building for them. And the artist always pushes you to think rather than uh, the gallery to think about who's gonna be actually using it, right? Which is something that, um, um, no, for example, to me, it was very interesting to go to the gallery and to know that, you know, like I can be drawing whatever in the office, but at the end of the day, there was just a single person there who could move that thing, right? And, um, and I felt that, you know, like you get deep into the nuts and bolts of how things work, right? Of, of maintenance, uh, transportation, etc. sort of like inform the design project. Um, so I, I guess that's it. I don't know if that's a very convincing uh, question, but uh, sorry, answer to your question, uh, Natalie. Um, but yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it was clear and insightful too. Could I go ahead? Yeah. So, so politics and architecture are in close relation and it is mainly politics what influences architecture and urbanity laws, fundings and competitions for public projects that determine the architectural process. What role do you think can architects and creatives play in reconsidering these political agendas? That, that's super interesting, sorry, that you're bringing that up because I feel that, that um, so, you know, we can talk about like the competitions and urbanism and like, let's say where big politics is involved, right? It's like a president who wants to build infrastructure, a president who doesn't want to, no? But I feel that what I'm more interested is in the politics, which also like um, engage people in their everyday life. So for example, one thing of the house that I thought it was interesting is that um, once the bubble bursted, everyone was blaming the clients of like, why had you been buying houses you couldn't afford, right? But then if you look at what, you know, it was kind of being instigated from the government was that to buy houses is the only thing you can do if you have a little bit of money, right? It's what's the safest in basement. Uh, you have a lot of like, um, uh, uh, um, let's say legally, it's more easy to do that than to invest in anything else. So there's a whole like law structure, which kind of like forces you 
You know what I mean? It's like, yes, you end up taking the decision, but if everything impels you towards that direction, yes, you're gonna end up buying a house because everyone around you is telling you that the only way that you can keep your the, the few money you're making safe, untouched, not getting down, not getting, is having a house, right? And, and I think that the politics there where, you know, like you have a client which has certain desires, but which is also impelled by the government, and the government, which, you know, kind of like incentivates a series of like politics. So that encounter to me is what's super interesting. Uh, and again, I think it looks back to the question that Diana posed about the client or the public, right? Um, if we think just politics and architecture about like who's sitting on the table and it's making decisions, I think it can be very frustrating because there's gonna be a lot of Asians which are always gonna be left out, right? But as I was saying, like, I, I feel that, you know, it's like Jaume and Maria Luisa, the owners of the first house, they had an idea uh, of what they wanted to do with the house, right? And there's, there are politics in there. There are some politics which are kind of countering the politics, the, the, grand, uh, the grandiloquent politics of like party I politics, can't... right? And to me, you know, this, 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 I don't want to like, people sometimes talk about micro politics, well, let's talk about politics. Uh, I, I think that those encounters between different agents where you recognize that everyone has some sort of political agency is something that I'm, I'm very interested in. And I'm not saying like, yeah, of course it's uh, unequal and unjust and not balanced, but I do believe, right? That, that, that um, politics happens throughout the architectural process from the most minute decision to what you were saying, the laws, the competitions, the infrastructures, which are directly funded by political parties in government. But thank you so much. I think and we're talking about infrastructure and we have the, the, the bridge behind you. So it's fantastic. <laughs> thank you. It was a very interesting point of view. Luis, um, thank you so much for being here today. And I would like to ask you my question. Ask you my question. Oh, OK. So um, there seems to be a split between aesthetics right now um, with, with one aesthetic um, from like modern and sleek, um, which belongs nowhere but everywhere at the same time. And an aesthetic that is considered to be kitschy, traditional and folkloric. Um, where do you see these two playing out in the future? Um, do you think that like one will supersede the other or is there a meeting point? What does this mean for the people who identify themselves in them? But I, I think that's super interesting. And, and I think that that um, what, what I thought that when I first encountered a few of the projects that I'm doing is that you end up, um, you know, you are, you've been out there in the world for a while. So, you know, like your opinion has been shaped, right? And when you say kitschy or folkloric, uh, that's super low with like bad terms and prejudgment uh, in a way which, which, which is what we've all been told, right? And I don't know, like there's something in, in suspending any kind of like moral or like good or bad consideration that I think it's productive or it was productive for the projects what I've done. Also because it's like who's controlling what's good or bad. And, and, and again, I think we're again into this kind of like things where, you know, like normally, you know, popular and kitsch is kind of similar. And then what, what's good, what's bourgeois design, uh, what's super mega expensive. So I think that, that um, our, like one of the tasks we should do, or well, I, I don't wanna like prescript anything to anyone, but one of the things I'm interested to do is to dismantle these systems of hierarchies of like kitsch, elegant, or like good taste and bad taste, right? Because I feel they are not neutral. So they are not only aesthetically based. As I was saying, like, look, the, 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 the webbing, the, the tubet is fantastic and it's beautiful, but it's not considered at the same level as a pH five lamp of, of, of Henry Paulson. And that's, that's not only based on its um, material or design qualities. It's also based on the fact that it's a textile, which who used to do textiles? Women, uh, where? At home, not out there in the public. Versus, you know, a person who's part of like a Scandinavian tradition of like good uh, design connected to, you know, like um, uh, industrialization, etc. So I feel that 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 those categories require to be dismantled. Uh, 
and that once they are dismantled, they you can this thing you were saying, like what what role would, would they play? I don't know. I think that once we have them like broken down and we understand them, which that's that's something that that I don't know if it came to the forefront. But we, what I try to do is like the person who built up this house in the first place, which looks to us maybe a ninety percent of the people who's here horrible, took the decisions for a reason, right? And 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 those decisions were taken for reasons which we don't uh, probably agree with, right? But I wanted to understand them uh, uh, because also like. I feel there's no. Um, well, I, I I think that that that, that architecture has to also like approach other knowledges and, and techniques. That's a person who has been building for all his life, you know. So if he did the house the way he did, I'm sure he took decisions for a reason, right? And then we can look at the reasons and we can be like, no, this is stupid. This is horrible. This is fine. This is understandable. Uh, we can work with that, right? Uh, but I think that that this approach, like, um, um, pretty much like, you know, it's like I keep getting back to Las Vegas book by 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 um, by Dennis Scott Brown and 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 Robert Venturi. It's like let's suspend judgment for a second to understand what's happening. And once we understand what's happening, then let's try to reconstruct it back and see what's of value, right? So this suspension of judgment, I feel it's it's very important. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your question. Um, if anybody would like to also ask any questions, you can unmute your mic um, and we'll take them one by one. I have two questions. Can I, can I begin? Uh, so uh, thank you so much for the great presentation. My students here are very much fascinated um, with um, your um, your approach to um, storytelling, uh, drawing making, uh, but also some of the technology that you incorporated uh, in your designs. Um, can you elaborate on the role of technology in your design methodology? specifically incorporation of low grade sensors and citizen science um, approaches in the way that you were thinking about maybe garden design or rethinking, uh, let's say, um, filtration uh, within uh, a domestic space. So that would be the first question. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. And, and sometimes I have to elaborate on those things on the spot because I haven't like I do them without really like thinking why that I do them. But I suppose that, that it has to do with some of the things we were discussing with Diana, for example, which is um, I think that what deserves high technology and what doesn't is also a construction which we're carrying on, right? So the moment you have like a pot at home and that pot is full of sensors, I mean, there's something there which is weird, which I think it's productive for me, right? And 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 that was very much the approach. Like I, I went somewhere and I saw this project of these people, which actually they were using, they were um, 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 Alvaro and Paula, which are the ones who designed the, sen uh, the sensor garden were working on. They found out somewhere, I don't know, like a manual made from NASA, uh, by NASA, which was saying like, if we go leave uh, outer space in colonies, which plants are most effective to be growing because they are gonna be the ones filtrating more air. And I was like, wow, that's fantastic, you know, to start using these technologies, which had been like state funded, uh, you no, know, which are, we're talking about big science at home, right? For something as stupid as a pot, right? I think that, uh, again, for me, that's a sort of sub subversion that I very much like. Um, and, and I think that I approach technology from, from there, not from, let's say, a fascination with the new, but a sort of like, I find that by over technology, I think things that don't need to, like the pods, right? You know, yeah, unexpected things can happen. There's something super fun uh, about that. No, there's that screen that I've talked about and the screen tells you how clean the air is, right? And according to that, the fans that you've seen work or not, right? And the clients, ones that I, I, I uh, no, um, one that was, that was done and they had been like dealing with the plants thing for a while, 
they were like creating this sort of dynamic where when the screen would say that the air was bad, they would open all the windows, you know, kind of trying to help the machine to work better, right? So this sort of dynamic of like suddenly, you know, you can communicate to the plants through this technological interface and the plants are saying that they cannot uh, filtrate as much air as they would want. And you kind of like develop this relationship to them where you open up every, you know, to me, it's, it's really fascinating, right? And, and, and it starts developing like alliances between things that you would never have expected that would happen. And, and, and I think that that's what really interests me about this sort of like application of, technolo of technologies which are not specially designed for something into that something, right? That's a, that, that was a great, um, um, I think I wasn't expecting that story, but that's a really beautiful story because when you were talking about mobility and um, often when you talk about mobile architecture, there's the technological approach. But then when you talked about mobility and architecture, your approach was, well, somebody needs to move it. So I think that component of really thinking about, let's say, mobilizing spaces or socio-spatial dynamics through sometimes technology that could be maybe a recycled bicycle wheel and sometimes it could be a, a, a DIY manual. I think it's really fascinating. My second question is um, regarding your representation methods and, um, and um, the, let's say the, the method that you uh, chose to, especially with the, the, the last uh, renderings that you were showing. So for instance, showing a splash of water on a camera lens. So there is a very uh, strong sense of storytelling in the representation methods that you, um, that you have shared with us today. So maybe can you elaborate on the role of storytelling and staging uh, in your work? Uh, you talked about working with uh, photographers, but I was wondering how does that come across when you're doing, let's say, traditional, more line-based drawing? Thank you. That's, thank you. That's a great question and 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 so there's and I don't know if that really or exactly answers your question but 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 let's try so there are two people um, that you might have now encountered uh, or not maybe in your training which I discovered like kind of late in my formation but which I love and they are very different but I but I think that that's where I, when I think about what do I do in drawing, I normally go back to these two people, which one is Enric Miralles, the, the architect in Barcelona, and the other one is Cazullo Sejima. Like Enric Miralles, you know, there are many legends about him, and there's this legend, which is true because you see it in his uh, plans, that he was only using one, you know, while everyone was using like rotring, like, um, you know, pens of different size, uh, line sizes, you know, like walls, uh, 0 0.5 thicker. He was using just one rotring for doing everything, a plan, a fluorescent on the wall. So, you know, suddenly the, the hierarchy of the line weight, you know, it's like you don't know what's more important because everything is drawn exactly the same, you know? So the project is somewhere there. And sometimes it's almost undecipherable to know if you are looking at a mark on the floor or at a column. And I think that this suspension of like the drawing does not determine exactly what it could be, but opens up possibilities is something I really like. And the other person that I absolutely, I'm absolutely fascinated with uh, uh, how uh, she draws is Kazuyo Sejima. And if you look at the Kazuyo Sejima drawings, like for a wall, she would do a line and then she would do the shoes that you leave in your house when you get in. And then she would do the pot with the flowers, right? So that's incredible because she's kind of like stating that everything is equally important. Right, and you would never think that, you know, getting in your house and leaving the shoes somewhere, you know, might determine your special experience. But it actually does, right? It's like, let's imagine ourselves in a Tadao Ando uh, house and getting in and leaving our shoes in there. The space this is fucked up, right? It's like this minimal space with nothing, etc. Right? Or, or I don't know, like, and I think that that to me, this lack of hierarchy of like. It's equally important what um, you know, what the user will do in the house, than what you determine. So that's why I'm just like drawing the uh, wall with just a single line, you know, and then I'm spending a lot of time drawing everything else. And that, to me, 
it's a way of understanding the, draw, the drawing not only as a technical document, but as a document where, you know, possibilities happen and the project ends up being there in the middle, no? And, and, and that's why I love to draw and draw and draw and draw and draw as much as I can. And, and in there somewhere, I know I'm gonna find the project, right? And the project and things are gonna start connecting to each other and making these alliances that we were talking about, right? Um, but but it's mostly an instrument which to me needs to be to carry on a lot of information, right? It's like a lot of information maybe just to later say only a very like uh, scarce response, but I need to, I don't know, it's something that gives me security, you know, and makes me feel comfortable to take decisions. Luis, uh, what was the second artist you said her name? It's uh, Kazuyo Sejima. Yes. She's a Thank Japanese you. architect, you know, oh, Sana. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Cause when I saw your drawings, I thought of um, this, I forgot their name right now. Oh, Atelier Bow Wow. Like they put so much detail in their drawings. Absolutely. Same I mean, way. Atelier Bow Wow are absolutely critical too. Like, uh, you know, they come from the Sejima uh, tradition too of Japanese architecture where, you know, like objects matter as much as the space they are building. And, and that to me is very important because objects is something that, I mean, I'm not gonna go to the house of the client and put the teapot in the stove. But to draw it is to recognize it that he can do that and that the space is gonna be equally fine. And, right. and this kind of like opening up the possibility for people to do whatever they want in the space through the drawing itself to me is, is something Im important, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luis, I have another question. Um, since you are based in Madrid, Barcelona, and New York, um, what are some of the similarities you see in working in these three different places? Super interesting. I've, I've, I haven't been like long enough in Madrid uh, since I came back. Uh, but that's very difficult. It's difficult, and I'm gonna like get. Uh, um, I would say that um, uh, on the standpoint of like uh, investigation, I'm super grateful. I was uh, uh, in the U.S. for a while uh, because I feel that. American academia and, and American universities are fantastic places where to explore ideas much more than in Europe where there are less resources devoted to that. So the, it's much more of a professional, professionalist, uh, uh, you know, like world from the onset. So I really like that. Um, but then also that means that, um, well, before the crisis in Europe, I'm sure there were a bit more possibilities uh, to do kind of things, now less. Uh, but, but, but maybe I would say that, that I can really feel how in the US there's an infrastructure which allows you to investigate um, and maybe not such a good infrastructure to implement what you're investigating on. Um, and in the US, you don't have that structure at all. You know, it's kind of discouraged to do so, but you might have opportunities where it would have been great to implement an investigation. So, no, no I don't know if that's convincing, but. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, you. that answered my question because it, it is very different kind of um, ideas from in the US and in Europe. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, that would be a great moment. So we are going to wrap up very soon. No? No questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you, Luis, so much for thank your you. time. I know it's a different, it's much, much late with you, so get some rest. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Te llamo Lisa.